Hi, Greg Perry, the Historic Preservationist. Welcome to the Conservation Studio. Uh, in this uh, short dissertation, we're going to talk about the, uh, me being an antiquarian horologist, um, getting very inquisitive times of the fakes in, in American horology. Um, you know, with limited skills, limited materials, um, I often marveled at some collectors that I work for or other collectors that would pay enormous sums of money for tall clocks and wall clocks. And, you know, for example, 80, 100, $150,000 for a tall case clock from New England. <clears throat> and they all look the same. They're the same movements. So these people get seduced by a name, by lore, by deception. They allow themselves to deceive by fake antique dealers. Um, fake clock dealers, fake clock antique dealers over the years. And um, it should be put out there that when these clocks that we're going to talk about are put up for sale, whether it be at auction or whether it be in their antique shops uh, or online, that these mechanisms were not made by the individuals who they were purported to be made by. So this led me to a lot of research. Um, going back, uh, I've had many discussions with Robert Cheney about this, and uh, Robert's going to Liverpool, as I've been in, in Liverpool many times doing research. And uh, it's just something did not seem right for many, many years of how some American clockmakers at pivotal points could be so prolific of their output of clocks. When a typical clockmaker in his lifetime may only be able to put out 20 to 26 clocks, clock mechanisms. So how could some of them be numbered into the thousands? So this led me to research and what we're going to find as a, uh, the mechanisms and the components were not fabricated here. So it led me to do research of somewhere else that a trade was broken down, finally divided. And that's where we're going to start today. So I uh, hope everyone enjoys this and uh, let's get started. So let's talk about a finely divided trade of craftsmen and artisans, fake American clock movements, particularly the Willards. So I would get a deaf ear after studying in the UK, a story the clockmakers, scholars, dealers, and collectors don't want you to hear. When I would hear the latest horological scholarship on American clocks, it doesn't matter if it's a winter tour or, or the like, I would smirk and think, when are they ever going to get it right? This treatise deals with the fakery and misconceptions of the Willard clock movements in Grafton, Massachusetts, and the people that sell their clocks still today, not enlightening potential buyers. So this shed light and opened up a plethora of information proving that there were only just a handful of craftsmen in the colonies that actually made tall case clock movements. During the mid 18th century through the 19th century, the American colonial clockmaker acquired complete movements, kits, castings, which were still in the sprues in order to contact and produce a tall case clock movement. The birth of the painted clock dial in the late 18th century through 19th century was an explosion in the manufacturing of clocks for a very quickly growing colonial population. In Boston alone, just after 1800, there was a tremendous boom of horological need. This treatise of deception applies to painted as well as brass style clocks. When Simon Willard in 1796 was putting for sale the tall case clock he had a staggering list of what he was offering to the public. Common clocks, steeple clocks, some with three dials, timepieces, which were banjos, spring wound clocks, clocks that would run a year, astronomical clocks, meeting house clocks, clocks that would play six tunes, and even a, song, a psalm on Sunday. One could only imagine Simon Willer, a very busy guy, getting little to no sleep for a person with such a pro prodigious output of material. To put it mildly, he would have had to have been a remarkably fast worker to say the least. 
Willard wanted to be portrayed as a traditional clockmaker or clockmaker 101, a clockmaker that does it the hard way. He wanted to be looked at it that way, making all the castings the hard way. There are no patterns, jigs, or diagrams known from Willard's workshops. If they were, one could compare the component by component with a supposed Willard mechanism. There were literally just a handful of other clockmakers whose diagrams, jigs, and their blueprints matched their existing movements in America. The Dominies, in their shop on Long Island, made clocks the hard way with their own hands, even their own cases. These were rural clockmakers working with limited tools in very unpopulated areas. The point is that the amount of jigs matched the product endpoint. But with the Willards, this is just not so, particularly painted dial Willard clocks. Some Willard tall case clocks have numbers well into the 1600s. Very prolific, wouldn't you say? Simon Willard wanted you to think he made all these clocks by himself. So how can a solo person make over 1,600 eight-day clocks and all the other clocks presumably mentioned in his paraphernalia and brochures? When other clockmakers over a 20-year period only could produce possibly a maximum of 50 clocks in their lifetime. This was their entire career. So obviously Willard was not making clocks the hard way, but from the Willard's bullshit story, people loved and ate up the nostalgia with the clockmaker sitting at his bench with apprentices filing parts and sweeping up the floor. So I can tell you that the story was far from the truth. In 1800 in Roxbury, Mass, I first thought that the true story lay in Birmingham, England where all these dials were being produced, painted. James Wilson and Charles Osborne were producing these for the Willard tall case clocks. These were generally acquired from a horological supply ship arriving in Boston once a month. Further research led me to libraries and major museums, but to no avail. So I found in Birmingham, England and in Liverpool, trade catalogs these were known throughout the decorative arts world in the 18th century England and across Europe in the 18th to 19th centuries, containing huge portfolios of parts and fixtures of brass finials, clock movements, candlesticks, etc. So let's back up a bit. We had painted dials coming out of Birmingham, England in huge, huge numbers. And these were being used on Willard's, Willard clocks with false plates, having an intermediate conduit that was mounted to the back of the dial and contained, and contained posts that would mount to the front of the movement with tapered pins. So this allowed a clockmaker in the 18th century, even from rural America, to mount his clock to a Birmingham dial. How convenient was that? And you can say you did it yourself. With only one consideration, design his movement with the drilled holes. He just had to have the holes in the right place. And these had to always be in the right or same dimension. Very simple, I would say. So this became an American standardization of fakery, basically. It gave Willard and others the ability to expand their output by using the dial from one manufacturer and the false plate from another. Perfect marriage. Just drill the corresponding holes in the movement and you were often in business. Painted dials were seen in America by 1781, England by 1782, by Wilson and Osborne. Back in America, the first American to advertise painted clock dials was Mr. Paul Revere, you know, the British are coming. He was a remarkable general tradesman. Yes, he made high quality tankards and porringers and the like, but he quickly tried to get away from the bench as I have studied him and others, 18th century tradesmen. They had one thing in mind, limit their own handwork at the bench. These guys knew they were not going to be making money like their big merchant friends that they would see on Sundays at church. 
if they were to stay working and at the bench and at the so-called bourgeois, bourgeoisie in America, they recognize that there are only hours in the day and there's only so many hours in the week. They needed to start their own and what they called themselves were manufactories of one sort or another. Manufactories. So how and where were these clocks really made? I lay the groundwork. One would have to be a caster, maker of parts by oneself. This is the hard way. That's a hell of a lot of work just to make a casting. You can't make a living doing one part at a time. The Willard's Enterprise, as we will call it, is the perfect study point. They were the largest clock makers in the colonies, and they were selling them with paint dials at this time. So hence, the real truth is that these clock mechanisms, the Willards and many others used, they just did not make. They were buying it from England. The Willards operated a farce theory saying that they made clocks when in fact they were purchasing all the mechanical components they ever needed. They were made in the Lancashire region of England by a finely divided trade of manufactories. So let's talk about movement comparisons. A handful of Boston and Philadelphia makers actually made their mechanisms the hard way. When studying what information exists about them, some created blueprints and wheel work and lever work on paper, with their construction and designs reflecting in a few of their related movements. By and large, the craftsmen that did make their own movements had a lifetime output of only 20 to 35 movements, with most of these seemingly not following any type of blueprints. This is the hard way, with pl plate drilling almost always not in the same locations. So when we speak of the Willards, all the holes and components are always the same on every different style of clock as per each style of movement. And they also match existing trade publications specifications in the Lancashire region. In addition, the Willards numbered their dials. Some of the Willards production numbers goes into the thousands. It would take a bench clockmaker 100 lifetimes to complete such a prolific production schedule. This is the easy way to put your name on the dial, the easy way. Just buying the components, simple. So this shows the slickness of the Willards. So I'll draw an analogy of an 18th century painted dial and a certain type of draw pin. A draw pin is a tapered pin that you can put in the back of the, the leg of the dial to attach it to the movement. And this was used in clock making. In 1805, an unskilled craftsman could make 20 of these common pins a day. And as the tradesmen became highly skilled at making these pins, it would not increase his output that dramatically. Only four to five pins a day more. There were 18 different operations to produce this common pin in the 18th century. So do we want to talk about divided trades? Yes. Once a pin was completed, it was entirely separate trade just to attach the pin to a separate piece of cardstock so you could market it. Now that's my kind of trade. Maybe you could sell that at two to three in two to three weeks. So in those 18 different operations, nine different trades were used distinctively different just to produce a sliding tapered pin. So how many trades do you think were used in an eight-day tall case clock movement. In period writing, it has been described as possibly up to 25 different trades to produce tall case clock movements in Liverpool, England. In the period, Peter Stubbs, a purveyor and merchant for objects, components, and hardware in Liverpool for the different trades, had a catalog. It was a full 85 pages both sides. For example, clock finials casts became and were supplied in 25 different sizes. This is how the average quote-unquote quote clockmaker throughout England and continental Europe operated his business at that time. 
This was all being operated from one of the longest port cities in the world. Its harbor could accommodate over 5,000 ships annually. Thousands of north-facing sides of houses carrying large banks of windows to elongate their workday. It still can be seen today in Liverpool, just take a trip there. Providing light to individual tradesmen, who many times where this was their actual home also. So specialized trades working at home started here. Division of labor. In 1800, one tiny village only had seven houses and seven of them were watchmakers making watch components. It's at the time there were actually over 25,000 individual tradesmen who would leave their home who worked on clocks or watches in the Lancashire area. So how did their trade operate? It needed a horological tool catalog. For example, screw plates to a hand-powered center lathe, which was one of the more complicated objects being sold and more expensive. The key for clockmakers was possible to buy a tall case clock movement in pieces, ready for assembly by the so-called American clockmakers. These were being sold to jewelry stores within say a mile and a half of where the Willards had their business running. Eventually, the Willards would buy them directly from Liverpool catalogs. Therefore, the movements could be ordered as kits, on spurs, or completely assembled with or without dials, or with or without their names on them. One could place an order at a jewelry store, and in 25 days, it would have been received and then shipped out of Liverpool. So a couple of days of processing, and in 25 days back, delivery to the colonies. Also at the same time, horological supply ships ran up and down the East Coast ports and would stop at each major city once a month at a seaport town, and this came from England. So let's talk about clock components, pinions. They had to be made of very high quality steel. So where was the best steel made? The best steel in the world was made in Sheffield, of course, so that you know you were buying top of the line. Even a non-iron clockmaker could tell the inferior quality of American steel. One single monthly order from the catalog from the Willards was 680 complete tall case clock movements. This showed how big this industry was in 1795 just in the colonies alone. Hence, this is where Willard got his clock movements, the easy way, the way to maximize his profits, profits under deceit. Here is another interesting correlation. On both sides of the Atlantic, the producer slash owner and the distributors in the colonies receiving it were all masons of the Masonic order. So how did you know you were going to get paid when you ordered something from England? Good question. There was a belief that Freemasonry held this type of catalog business together, making it possible. There was a guy in New England, John McFarlane. He ran a catalog wholesale and retail clock, watch, and jewelry supply concern in Boston. He stocked the majority of his offerings which could supply clockmakers at a moment's notice. He also sold finished watches with John McFarlane's name and city engraved on them. But these were made in Liverpool. The name could be abraded off and the supposed watchmaker's name could be put right back on. More fakery. So here, the merchant in Boston is representing himself as a watchmaker, but this is totally false. The Willards had a huge business in Roxbury. This was a huge manufacturer at the time, the largest in the colonies. The owners were supposedly making their own clocks by hand at the bench. Aaron and his son and the other 60 employees were dial makers, carvers, decorative glass painters, cabinet makers, etc. But he wasn't manufacturing clock movements there. He had that all figured out. He was utilizing Liverpool system some way or in a combination of the Boston 
or American system that I just extrapolated on. A typical Willard tall case clock was offered in the early 1800s for $50 to $60, which included a Liverpool dial and movement and a case by a local cabinet maker. Willard insisted of his apprentice that they sign on a dotted line that they would preserve the art and mystery of clock making. This means keep your mouth shut what happens under my roof and also the related tools that he sold. Today, we know a little bit more about this mystery of Willard. The mystery was Willard did not make this stuff. We kind of just made this whole thing happen, is what he said. Just putting it all together, that's what the Willards did. The Willards attended the First Church of Roxbury, flush with artisans and the working class, in a collaborative fashion, who comprised one of the largest assemblages of talent in the history of American decorative arts. So in that church on Sunday morning, the largest mass of decorative artists in America would have been in one place. What Simon Willard observed in the division of labor in Lancashire, he brought it here to America and recreated it on Meeting, Hill, Meeting House Hill in Roxbury. It was very successful until the reign of cheap clocks coming in from Connecticut. So let me say a word about profitability. Simon Willard dies with $585 to his name, and he was one who did all this marketing. He had the great manufacturing. Paul Revere died with 5,850 as a merchant. So it shows where the emphasis was putting, where these artisans wanted to move out and they wanted to be like the merchant class. Um, and so hopefully we did some clarification and I feel sorry for anyone who is a Willard clock out there, a tall case clock. They're all Liverpool movements. They're standard Birmingham dials. And uh, in addition, um, all the all the, the all the or the all the uh, I'm sorry all the casework is the same. I mean, it gets quite a bit boring. It's not a very exciting case. A round top case, a little bit of fretwork, and and I know too many clients who paid fifty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars for these things. So, anyway, hopefully this en enlivens the debate of where the American tall case clock movement was made. So Greg Perry, the historic preservationist, signing out. Thanks for uh, joining me.